because ultimately healing is not fixing. Healing is an ongoing encounter with God's love that brings us into wholeness and communion. Well, we got a real treat for you today on the show, Sister Miriam James Heidland, uh, one of my favorite human beings on the face of the earth. You are going to be blessed by today's episode. Uh, Sister Miriam, I know a lot of you are already familiar with her. A Division One volleyball player back in college experienced an unbelievable conversion. Uh, went through a lot of suffering in her life, but man, is now using the redemption that God has brought about through those wounds to heal so many other people. Uh, she's the co-host of the Abiding Together podcast, which I'm sure some of you already listened to. Uh, she's a consecrated religious sister with the SOLT order. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes for that order if you want to learn more about her and her ministry. But uh, man, we take a beautiful deep dive today into some really heavy stuff of healing from stuff from the past, of how you can know uh, when this stuff is not being dealt with, what your body is telling you about that, and how to process those wounds, how to learn how to trust again, how to learn to forgive other people for what they did to you, how to forgive yourself, and how to know when you're not supposed to forgive yourself because it wasn't your fault to begin with. So you want to take a deep dive into all this stuff, whether you're married, single, religious, priest, uh, there's something in today's show for everybody. I know it's going to be a huge blessing for you, but before we bring Sister Miriam on to the uh, show. I want to remind you there's a little bit time left to come on the pilgrimage with Father Augustino and I over to Assisi and to Rome in January. We have a couple spots left. Would love to have you on that trip. So if you're sitting on the fence, I don't know, man, don't miss this thing. It's going to be an amazing opportunity, middle of January, to spend a week over in Europe going into these amazing cathedrals and churches and Colosseum, the catacombs, the foundations of Franciscan spirituality and Assisi. Uh, we're going to be going underneath St. Peter's to do a Scavi tour to the bones of St. Peter himself, uh, an audience with Pope Francis. And so we'd love to have you on the group. We already got about, I think about 25, 26 people on the group, but we'd love to get to right around that 30 mark. So we'd love to fill up all the bus that we have and uh, have you come with us on that. So if you want to learn more about the pilgrimage, sign up. Uh, just go to chastity.com. You'll see a pop-up ad right there. Just click on it. It'll have all the details. And there is still time to sign up, but it's running short. So uh, bring yourself, your family, your spouse, your kids, uh, grandma, grandpa, doesn't matter. Everybody's invited to that. Also, just want to thank all of our patrons that have supported us through Patreon. You guys are the reason this show uh, basically exists. So I want to thank you for your commitment of supporting us and then invite anyone else who wants to join that community of givers. These are just people who maybe kind of felt blessed along the way by our ministry and wanted to kind of just give back. And so some of them give $5 a month, some give 20 a month or more. And, uh, and we just try to return the gift by keeping this podcast growing and going. Uh, we'll send you free gifts as well for supporting us. I'll give you early access to the podcast episodes, share my personal email with you. If there's anything you need help with, I'll personally respond to that stuff as well. So if you want to support us, click the link in the show notes or just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett. But without further ado, uh, you're not here to see me. Uh, you're here to listen to Sister Miriam James. She is an unbelievable gift to the church. And if you don't know why, you're about to find out why. So enjoy the show. Sister Miriam, welcome to the program. Hi, Jason. How are you, my friend? It is a joy to have you on. I'm wearing my, my uh, SOLT gray in honor <laughs> of your appearance on the podcast. So. Yeah, we look like twins, yeah. <laughs> oh, but, no, every time I've ever met you, encountered you at different conferences, I've just always walked away just consoled, just feeling maternally loved and seen and, you know, you know, we bumped into each other for years, but just every time I ever see you, I just feel like, oh, like, I just, I just feel consoled in your presence. I think it's a charism that God's kind of given to you for the building up of the church. And so I just want to affirm you and thank you for your maternal sisterly love for all of us brothers out there. It's just been a joy. Oh, thank you, friend. I appreciate that. It's always nice to see you in the vineyard and like, oh, we got a fellow brother in the vineyard. So yeah, yeah. thank you for how you give the gift of yourself. Yeah, it's so, so beautiful. Today, I was just just so looking forward to having our listeners have the advantage of what I've had the opportunity to encounter in you, uh, of, of just your witness, your authenticity, uh, your, your closeness to our Lord, and just how, how real you are in the struggle with it all. And I know many of our listeners are familiar with your podcast and your talks and have followed you for years. Uh, for some people, it might be their first 
introduction to you. So I thought it'd be maybe a good place to start if you could kind of share your story of, you know, where you came from, what the struggle was, where God led you out of that, and how maybe that prepared you for what he's uh, using you for now in the church. So, uh, you know, the focus on lust is born, obviously focusing on chastity, dating, relationships, vocation, and all that. But maybe if you could share from those perspectives a bit of your testimony, uh, you know, a little cliff note version of, uh, of where God has led you, and then we can kind of dive into the questions on healing that I know that are on the hearts of a lot of our listeners. Mm-hmm. No, thank you for that. I, I think as you share, if you as you just open that, the thing uh, that hits me most is the desire that I've had for a long time is to love well and to mm-hmm. love excellently. And you know, people see me today, and they see I've been in my religious community about twenty five years. I belong to the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, and I came in right out of college and. Um, people look at you and like, okay, what, what would you possibly know about life? And, you know, like they say in 12-step meetings, we only know a little. <laughs> so I'm still learning. Like I just told you before we started recording, man, it's been a rough week for me and I am <laughs> learning. I am learning new lessons and learning new things. But luckily, yeah. the blessedly, I should say, that the school of love is never complete. And so I probably maybe like a lot of your listeners, I grew up Catholic and my, we went to mass every Sunday. My parents were very serious about that. And I, you know, went to CCD, went to our, our you know, um, catechism and confirmation classes and things like that. But I, I had never fallen in love with Jesus. I didn't know that was even a possibility. And I learned some of the rules, and I say some, and some were distorted of Catholicism. And I really thought in my heart, you know, we often say that there, we all of us have a theology of the head, and all of us have a theology of the heart. And you can hold a doctorate in moral theology, and also, but have a very different theology of your heart. And the heart is the lived experiences that we've had. And I didn't know in the depths of my heart that God really loved me, that um, he was for me. I really thought in my heart that God was, you know, like this entity that kind of sucked the fun out of everything. And you avoid things because you don't want to go to hell, right? So don't don't have sex, you're going to go to hell. Don't drink, you're going to go to hell, like those kind of things. But And are there certain things as mortal sins? Yes. But ultimately, what those aspects of what God is calling us to is a love that is excellent. And part of my part of this the sorrow of my life and all of us have sorrowful mysteries um and i think two of my biggest sorrowful mysteries are being conceived out of wedlock in high school and being given up for adoption and just the way that i found out about my adoption was quite traumatic and that story of ruptured attachment from the womb of never knowing certain things about myself that was part of the sorrow and then the other sorrowful mystery was being sexually abused when i was 11 years old and I think probably um, a lot of your topics that you talk about, and you know, we've spoken about your podcast before, but really many times what we're speaking about is our trauma responses. Lust is a trauma response. Lust mm-hmm. is a trauma response of broken communion, of an ache for intimacy, because in the beginning it was not so. And so from a lot from those sorrowful places and in combination with our broken humanity, I developed a lot of trauma responses, things like alcohol addiction, lust addiction a lot of self-hatred, clinical depression, perfectionism, um, yeah, self-rejection, a lot of judgment and criticism of other people. And, and as, as I said, I, I can say those things with great compassion for those parts of my heart without any sort of permissiveness. But when I see those places in my heart, of places my heart has been aching. And so underneath all of what we're doing, whatever it is, whatever kind of thing that we are trying to manage our pain through, at the bottom is a deep root and an ache for love. And that desire to love well and to be loved well never goes away because it's an ache for heaven. And so I ended up playing um, Division One volleyball in college. I wanted to work for ESPN. Um, I was pursuing a career in journalism um, so I could be able to do that when I was in college. And then God just radically interrupted my life through a beautiful, holy Catholic priest. And that man had been a priest a long time, and he just came into my life, and he just absolutely loved me as a good father. And I had never met anybody that holy. He wasn't perfect, but I never met anybody that holy. Somebody who loved, like he loved Jesus, he loved his priesthood, and he loved me. And there were a lot of things in my life that I could deny, but I could not deny just the radiance of Christ in that man. And I remember being 21 years old, and he'd been mentoring me for a few years at that point. And I was, you know, an active alcoholic, pretty much living with a second guy at that point. And just a, just a lot of sorrow in my heart, a lot of ache. And I just remember looking at him one day, and he had come to visit the college that I was at, and he was doing some ministry in the area, and he was just radiant. And I could just see Jesus looking at me through his eyes, and I said, Father, I don't know what's happening here, but I don't know what you have, but whatever it is, I want that. 
whatever, whatever's happening, I want whatever you have. And he just smiled and he said, you come and see. <laughs> and so that was, that was 20, over 25 years ago. And it was wow. really the beginning of religious life was when I began healing in religious life. So I didn't, all of us have kind of a stereotypical idea of religious sisters being perfect and as if we have no faults. And well, you're never going to find anybody this side of heaven who has no faults and no struggles. Mm. And so it was in that, in that reality is where I, the Lord began to call me to deep healing. And it has been over an 18 year journey of healing, of sobriety, of recovery, of love, of littleness, of humility. And I tell you, Jason, I hope, I hope it never ends. I hope I never turn mm -hmm. to Jesus, this side of heaven and say, that's enough. Cause I just want to continue to grow in love. So that's a, that's a bit about my story. No, th thank you for sharing that. I want to circle back to what you had mentioned. I think a lot of people haven't considered of lust being a trauma response. A lot of people think, oh no, childhood's over there. That stuff's over there. You know, my relationship with my boyfriend and girlfriend, this is a totally different thing. We don't realize how we're kind of living out of those wounds. And, you know, to circle back to an 11 year old girl having suffered what you suffered, there, there's an ache, I think, there to be seen, but a fear to be seen at the same time. Like, I'm, I'm so afraid to be vulnerable anymore. I'm so afraid that anyone will know, because if they know, I mean, all hell's going to break loose and I'm going to be judged. And I'm, it's just going to be such a mess. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to tough it out. And I don't know what, what your response was and what the possibilities for, for healing, but most of the young people that I meet, there's just no way to even begin to process this stuff. I, I remember meeting, I was on an Indian reservation once and uh, met a, a high school girl, Native American, who had been sexually abused by 13 different guys. Um, not, not times, but guys, multiple times, multiple guys. And I'm talking to this girl, she's probably 16 years old. And it's like, how do you even begin the healing process? And I, and I think she was in a sense that she was kind of opening this to me to just let me see her. Because this is what so much is at the ache of the lust is to be seen to have someone look at you with desirability because you feel so undesirable if you've been through these things. And so you're kind of offering what they're least likely to reject. But then afterwards, you just feel more unseen than ever. And so how can a, a young person who's got this stuff that have struggled with this, or maybe even an old person who's got it. And it's like, I've been burying this for three years. I'm afraid to tell my parents I've been burying it for 25 years. My spouse doesn't even know. How do you go back to that, that, that kind of wounded child and be able to let them be seen in a safe way by others when the thing they crave the most to be seen is the thing that they fear the most? I know that's a loaded question, but like, um, what counsel would you give to someone who is a afraid to be seen when, when they ache for that so badly. That was very well put. And you, you brought up a lot of nuances there. And I, if I could just for a second, I, this really does, it really does go back to Genesis, which I know you talk about a lot. It's Adam in the garden when God says, where are you? And he says to me, I was, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And that same trifecta of responses happens in our hearts every day. I think if you could come put in common parlance, it would be I'm seen or I might be seen here. I'm afraid because I'm unlovable. And so I have to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that we, we, we all have our set of fig leaves, don't we? I think, I really do think all of us, especially as adults, we have very sophisticated fig leaves. <laughs> and it's like, we go into our closet. We're like, which one for this set occasion will help me cover my nakedness where I feel vulnerable or I feel little or I feel yeah. dependent. And, and uh, it's Father Boniface Hicks, which I'm, I'm sure maybe you know him, mm -hmm. but he has a wonderful saying that every personal weakness is a near occasion of communion. Hmm. Every personal weakness is a near occasion of communion. And yeah. for most of us, we, we think it's a near occasion of rejection or abandonment yeah. or sin or, yeah. so like what's, ha I think part of what's happening there is something that you actually articulated was allowing ourselves to be seen by someone who is safe to see us. Because not everybody is safe enough to be seen. Some people are not whole enough to love us for who we are. Yeah. And so that I was watching a masterclass on the healing of trauma a couple of years ago, and it was some of the foremost experts in the latest scientific research in trauma. And one of the, one of the therapists was saying that every single one of us in our wounds has a secondary wound, which is having nobody safe to tell that wound to. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing, really. It's really, it's really amazing how we, what we face in our life and we just go on with life. Like you know, somebody's sexually abused or they look at porn or all these areas of shame or degradation or, um, you know, the secrets we keep. And then we just go to dinner at night and yeah. act like everything's, it's, it, it really is just like, yeah. that's crazy. So I think yeah. for all of our listeners, no matter, all of us have been 
violated in ways. All of us have areas where our hearts have been taken, our mm -hmm. hearts have been wounded, our sorrowful mysteries. The first step is really admitting that that's there. And for a lot of us, that can be the hardest part of like, no, 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 I deserved it. No, no, it didn't happen. No, it was actually, no, what this happened. And it was, and it's really hard. And I feel it in my body. I feel it in my heart. There's been a major fallout of that. Mm -hmm. And I think being honest about that and br bringing that first place within ourselves to the Lord is, is the first place to start. Because if we can't admit that here, we're going to have a hard time admitting it to anybody else. And yeah. so I think that's really the beginning. And then, yeah, then bringing those places into deeper healing, which we can talk about as we go. But really it is the first step of like, wow, this happened to me. And then like that yeah. beautiful young woman, her next step in her life was telling you somebody who instead of using her instead of mocking her or telling her it was her fault just to receive somebody in love which is so healing and saying i'm so sorry that happened to you that was very wrong and yeah. that is not okay i'm sorry that and that in and of itself is like oh i just revealed some of the most shameful parts of myself to somebody and they didn't run away or cower mm -hmm. it just it rewires our brain it rewires our body how we experience things in our hearts and that that is just a beautiful way of how god begins to heal and continues yeah. to yeah, because I remember hearing a quote once that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human connection. It's and easy, a lot yeah. of people yep. that think that, no, no, opposite of sobriety is just kind of white knuckling and I've got a victory streak going for two months. I'm really the opposite of, you know, but it's like, no, it's, it's that human connection, that the ability to allow yourself to be seen in, in your brokenness. And for, you know, a young person who's been abused in, in the face of trauma, they say you've got those responses. You can fight or you can flight. But for a young person, sometimes don't, those aren't even options. You can't fight this aggressor. You can't fly anywhere. It's in your house. And so you kind of disconnect. You just kind of disconnect yourself from the world, from reality. And it's, it's, it's a security mechanism that you turn to, but then you end up living out of this mechanism, uh, I, I think, for years. And so did you find that that was something, you know, for a young person that, that you experienced? It was like, I can't run. I can't hide. I, I just need to just black it out. Right, really speaking about is the phenomenon of disassociation, which mm -hmm. is a, one of the defense mechanisms God gives us to be able to survive. You know, many times people in a car accident uh, or something, when they r witness something horrific, the brain has an automatic shutoff point that God gives us to protect us. And we don't forget those things. Our brain records, science know now that every every memory we've ever had from conception is recorded within us. Either it's an, in, an explicit memory or an implicit memory, but everything, nothing goes away. It's all yeah. within us and it's stored in our bodies. And so th there's other, we talk about fight, flight, but therapists have also developed other ones. One is called freeze. Mm -hmm. where you just freeze like you're a deer in the headlights and this happens and you freeze. One of them is called fawn, where you go into people pleasing, like trauma, people yeah. pleasing is a trauma response or codependency or enmeshment is a trauma response or even flop. Some people literally like roll over and play dead just to make sure nothing worse happens to them or just to get it over with more quickly. And I, <laughs> we all have the variations of these and, and just to offer such kindness to your listeners, because many times we hate those parts of us. We, why didn't I tell somebody? Why didn't I yeah. run away? Why didn't I say no? And oh my gosh, dear friend, when you were little or when that happened to you last week, there's there's so many stories of why, of why your body responded that way, why your brain responded that way, why that seemed like the safest way. And and with the Lord befriending that part of us and allowing that part of us to tell the story will actually bring us through to freedom. And these are such sacred places. I, I just, oh my goodness, that aren't to be hated or criticized or condemned, but to be brought into the kindness of love and truth. And that's where healing is found. I was speaking at a school last week and after the talk, a whole crowd of um, the LGBT students immediately came up and they had their trans buttons on and this and that. And they each identified themselves, um, you know, partly by their names and partly by their identifications. I'm sure. bi, I'm trans, I'm this, I'm that, because they, sure. they were so kind of finding a label that would resonate with their lived experience. And, you know, they, they shared with me, they were grateful. They felt that you know, they, they felt seen in the talk and they felt acknowledged and, and, and loved. And, you know, I was trying to express to them that the church sees you you know, God sees you. And I told him, you know what? God's the only one who really sees you. Those nights that you've spent where you couldn't talk to anybody, where you were a mystery even to yourself, he's the only one who got you. He was the one who was there. And, and that darkness, when you thought he was absent, he was the one who was so present to you. And I was just really just trying to drive home. We see you. We get you. Because like you said, if you go through all this stuff in the end of the day, 
you just kind of have to print like it, it didn't happen. Like, okay, that trauma didn't happen. I don't have anyone to pour that out to. You're ju- you just got to, what do I do with this? I got to stuff it. I got to bury it. I got to suppress it. But you know, the, there's that book in psychology, the body keeps the score. Yes. And it talks about how your body, you yes. know, keeps this. And you had mentioned just in passing, like, listen to your tar, listen to your body. But it's like, wait a minute, listen to your body. Because what's going on in there? Like, okay, if you've been through something difficult and then you're around guys and then all of a sudden you just feel this tension arise up in you, like, am I safe right now? Like in the midst of being unable to trust your memory, I I think what we've got to do is like, at least trust your body. Is your body telling you everything's safe, everything's peaceful? A lot of times that's the last place we look, but sometimes it's the most reliable guide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's part of... What happens many times in disassociation is we we disassociate from our bodies and our bodies, we end up like kind of lugging around our bodies or we hate our bodies or we blame our bodies. And you know this from theology that, that it's not the body's not to blame. The body yeah. is given to us as a great and wonderful gift. And and it's actually what happens. It's very interesting. Uh, the scientific research shows that actually when an emotion is released in our brain, that the, the kind of cocktail of chemicals that it releases actually only lasts 90 seconds. Hmm. And it runs through us. And there's something to like, say, for example, you and I, maybe whether you're having a conversation with your wife, whatever's happening, we feel fear. And our first temptation is like freeze. We feel like the knot in our stomach. Trauma is often held in the midline of the body. So I feel like my shoulders are tightening. My neck might hurt. All of us have places we carry trauma. Instead of numbing ourselves or reacting, if we can sit in a 90 second window and just go within ourselves and say, Jesus, what's happening to me right now? I'm feeling really afraid. I'm feeling very little. Sometimes we find we actually feel like we're six years old. It's very interesting. Sometimes I'll ask people, how young do you feel right there? How young do you feel? And it's very interesting how often we can be 40, 50, 60 years old and we actually feel young. Like we feel like a child. What's going on there? What, and to be able to name, there's power in naming, you know, when God, you know, speaks existence happens and being able to say, I'm feeling afraid right now. I'm feeling nervous. I'm afraid I'm going to be abandoned. I'm afraid I'm going to be rejected. And just kind of naming that and allowing that to rush through our bodies. And if if we're in a safe place, just to say, okay, I'm here. It's, you know, like Wednesday at noon. I'm mm-hmm. sitting in front of my desk. There's fall leaves in the window. Okay. What happened to me then is not happening to me now. Okay, Jesus, come and speak the truth to me. And those small windows that we can to come back into our bodies and to experience unpleasant emotions in safety and then be able to respond instead of reacting. Oh. That's transforming. And that's very hard. Most of us spend most of our life running from uncomfortable emotions, but that's the place we must go, not by ourselves, but with the Lord and ideally with people who can help us. And that then we begin to see a different story unfold. The narrative changes and we can begin to see the way that God sees. It's profoundly a healing and it's beautiful. It's not easy, but it's beautiful. No, I think that's that's super helpful. Just kind of to ground yourself in the midst of yes. these little micro PTSD episodes that might be surfacing, and maybe not micro. I mean, they could be macro ones. Mm-hmm. Of, okay, mm-hmm. is this actually going on right now? Am I yes. really in a, a position of being threatened? Do I need to respond as if I'm being threatened, or do I need yes. to? Not, do, I don't need to run away from this right now. I need to maybe go go into this right now. Like mm-hmm. God's bringing this up. You remember there was a. A psychologist once said that there was these tar pits far outside of Los Angeles in the desert. And every once in a while, a dinosaur bone will just like whip to float up to the surface. And it's like, whoa, where the heck is that? And he said, when you're in a position where you're doing work, you know, whether it's counseling or prayer, this stuff's just going to start bubbling up because God wants to bring this up to the surface. And you might thought, no, 100 yards underground, it's buried, it's safe. But it's like, no, that's the most dangerous place for it to be. It's got to come up and gradually. And I would imagine that in your own journey, one of the things that maybe per, perhaps prevented stuff from coming up was, was unforgiveness. Cause I know a lot of people like, how did forgiveness play a role in your own life in terms of the things that had happened to you when you were young, maybe stuff that happened to you in dating relationships in college. And I just finished a book today by father Jacques Philippe. I've gotten hooked on his stuff recently. And it's just, I mean, it's not a great accomplishment to finish his books because they're all like 40 <laughs> pages along each and they're just fantastic. But You're yeah, so good. plowed through a bunch of them the last couple of weeks and they're just gold. I mean, it's so rich. And he was closing the book on trusting in God, uh, just on this note of forgiveness that like, if you don't forgive, you're kind of, you're forever a prisoner of the past. And you, in a sense, you think you're keeping the other person in jail because like, hey, you did this, you're in jail, I'm not forgiving you. But the bars are around you if you're not letting go of that offense. And so could you maybe share uh, for a moment just the, the battle and, and uh, the success that you found of going through that forgiveness process of somebody else? And then later, we maybe dive into like forgiving yourself. But like, let's look into the the forgiving others and how 
absolutely essential that is for healing, for repentance, and for all of the, the transformation to take place. Gosh, that's such a great topic that you bring up. And I, it goes along with everything in our heart because everything is bound and loosed within our heart. And just to share with you, one of the best things I found about church teaching is that church teaching is not irrational. It might be above our nature, but it's not contra our nature. Mm -hmm. It's not contra our intellect. And so it's very beautiful in the catechism. It talks about in the section on forgiveness, it literally says it is not in our power not to feel or to forget an offense. Can we just like... Yeah, sit on for a long time. Because <laughs> for a long time, I you talk about the theology of the head and the heart. It was Jason. It was well until religious life when I was inviting me to go into deeper places of forgiveness in my life, and I did not know this about myself because we don't know what we don't know. Um, but I didn't know that in my heart I had a belief that if I forgave the person who hurt me the most, what I was really doing was letting them off the hook, mm -hmm. and they were going to get away with it. Yeah, and you can hear you can hear the hurt in my heart there because there was yeah. a grave injustice. Our anger that God, you know, God gives us the emotion of anger to write what is wrong. And Dr. Robert Enright in his book The Forgiving Life, he talks about how the first step of forgiveness is admitting that we're angry mm. because from the anger come the anger comes from an injustice. And yeah. so there's an injustice, and many of us stay at anger, and we, the anger then distorts. But but the anger is telling us that there's pain underneath our hearts and. Yeah. It's the pain. Many times there's a lot of like, like Dr. Bob talks about how there's a lot of lies we believe about ourselves. Mm -hmm. The ju judgments we have about the other person who hurt us. And then the inner vows we make to make sure that will never happen again. So, mm -hmm. so let me, so for example, I'll give you an example from my own life of the person who sexually abused me, the person who wounded me the most, who, who I uh, had confronted twice and who was not sorry at all. Oh, wow. So like, what are you supposed to, like, what are you supposed to do? Like, what do you do when somebody is not sorry at all and says, no, you actually, you need help. You're crazy. You're making that up. And so I knew that God was like de deeply inviting me into these places of my heart. And so what were, what was I believing about myself? Well, I was believing that nobody listens to me, that this will never be well, that that person's going to get away with it, that, and then, you know, the judgments I had about that person is that they're self-centered, they're awful, they're a monster, they're whore. I mean, you could, and you can hear the pain in my heart yeah. and the inner, you know, the inner vows that I made is I will never be vulnerable. I will never trust anybody. Nobody will ever see the truth about me or I will always be taken advantage of. I will always be abused. So you can hear like mm -hmm. both sides of that story, but it wasn't until journeying down to the, to, to the really, to the deeper places of, you know, of part of what forgiveness is, why it's so daunting is that forgiveness, like the parable of the unforgiving steward, you know, it's like us having the person by the collar of their shirt and choking them. Part of forgiveness, Jason, is actually taking a full account of what that person did and exactly how it hurt us. Mm -hmm. Because we don't forgive like generalities, you know, like, oh, I forgave my dad. And then you see your dad at Thanksgiving and get mad all over again. It's like, no, it's actually, what are the things your dad did? And, and write it out. What did he do? Maybe your dad was, so for this person who sexually abused me, this I mean, stole something from me, just shattered my heart. And then, you know, it just was awful. To, it was just all these different things. And, and that can be very painful for us because that's where many times we want to either disassociate or minimize or say it's not that big of a deal or they didn't know mm -hmm. any better. It is a full-on rendering of an account. And that takes a lot of time of this yeah. person did this and this and this and here's how it hurts. And then it is through the grace of Jesus Christ, us being willing to not, to not exact justice. Justice will be served. It just won't be served by us. So yeah. what we do is maybe it needs to be turned over to civil authorities or canonical authorities or, mm -hmm. you know what, at the end of the day, just one more thing to borrow, a cliched saying, I was listening to Dr. Jordan Peterson many years ago, and um, he was giving a talk, I think at Oxford, and somebody asked him, they said, Dr. Peterson, what have you, what have you learned over the last like 20 years of speaking all over the world and, you know, all these things? And it was very interesting because he got very quiet and he said, what I've learned is this, no one gets away with anything. Hmm. no one gets away with anything. And he talked about forgiveness. Very interesting. It's like, if you're withholding forgiveness from somebody thinking you're getting away with it, you're not, it's eating you alive. And yeah. he said, if you perpetrated a crime and you're not admitting it and you're not taking responsibility for your own actions, like you're not getting away with it. He said, it's eating you alive. And at the end yeah. of the day, every single, every single person who's hurt us, they will have a meeting with God face to face. And one day they will know. One day, every person who's ever hurt us, who may not even want to admit it this life or doesn't even know, one day they will know. And that means you and I do not have to spend the rest of our life trying to exact justice for something mm -hmm. we can't get back. Yeah, And that's hard. And that's a very tender, it's a lifelong process in many mm -hmm. ways. And that's okay that it's a process. But that's just some of what forgiveness is. So just to kind of reframe our understanding of that, it's not letting somebody off the hook or condoning or you know excusing bad behavior. It's actually just the opposite. Yeah. So, 
I know that's a lot, but yeah, because yeah. you hear those expressions, I'll just forgive and forget, which is really yeah. awful advice that makes you think, well, if I still remember what they did to me and I haven't had amnesia, then I must not be a truly forgiving no, person. Exactly. When that first step you mentioned is so affirmative of, okay, acknowledge you're angry, um, not to condemn yourself, but because there's such yes. a thing as righteous anger. Because yes. an unjust offense took place. And if you're not acknowledging the righteous anger, you know, then you're not acknowledging the reality of the wound. And so yes. it's affirming to be able like, okay, maybe it's okay that I'm angry, yes. but I need to not live out of that anger. I need to affirm exactly. the wound of something real actually take place there. Now, I know with that anger, it could turn back on us when it comes yes. to forgiving yourself. Because if you've suffered sexual abuse, sometimes you internalize false blame and you start pointing the anger towards you. Like yes. I was wearing that outfit and I did have too much to drink. And my mom told me not to hang out with that guy. And, and I, my, you know, all these different things where you think of how you could have potentially in a billion different ways avoided that situation or ended it sooner or made it not happen as bad as it was. Like you start just analyzing the heck out of it because you've got so much free time because you're not talking to anybody that you're just talking to yourself. And all these hypothetical scenarios just abound in your mind of how you, it was ultimately kind of comes back to you. You know, maybe if it's even 4%, you know, that 4% is yours. And, and you just start torturing yourself and not forgiving yourself. And so maybe it's a, yeah, you don't need to forgive yourself for being abused, but maybe unhealthy relationships with guys where you're doing dumb stuff. And then it's like stupid me. And then again, you start beating yourself up over the head with these things. So could you maybe share a little bit about uh, how you don't need to forgive yourself for being sexually abused and how you can kind of reject that false shame and blame, but then how to actually forgive yourself if you've done some dumb things and, and you need to forever quit holding it over your head and just rubbing your own nose in this. Oh gosh, that's tender, isn't it? Oh, that's so tender. And I think particularly with sexually abuse, with sexual abuse, that seems to me the most common form of abuse that the victim blames themselves. Mm -hmm. And and many times the victim is blamed by the by the perpetrator saying this is your fault, you wanted oh, yeah. it. If you tell anybody I'm going to kill you, you, you know, I, it's so much just the, just one of the ways the enemy loves to shatter us. And mm -hmm. so I think that um just understanding like that. And I think that's one of the ways that we as, you know, try to get control. If like, if I can just figure it out, then I can get control over it. So we keep trying to like go back to the thing over and over and over again in a way of control. But like any, like we were talking about earlier, part of it is admitting, like we said, and sitting in a place of sorrow and grief and lamenting of this happened to me. This happened to me. And many times, just the way that God makes our, makes our bodies, our bodies experience a response many times to sexual abuse that is both pleasurable but also horrifying. Mm -hmm. And there's a massive ambivalence that most victims find a hard time even just naming. Like, just to help you understand that your body isn't not bad and you're not bad because maybe your body reacted in a way that was horrifying or you feel like your body betrayed you. Or many times, perpetrators in their own brokenness use kindness to groom. Wow. And so there's so much so much nuance there of what's happening. And so I think coming to terms with that, that truth of sitting in that truth and grieving the betrayal, grieving the sorrow, many times things that are mysterious to us that we don't understand. I think that's very important. And I'll, I'll asking Jesus also for the grace to release our own grasp upon mm -hmm. our throat. And in the, in the places where we all know that maybe we could have made a better decision in certain ways, it doesn't, nobody's ever criticized or shamed into a conversion. And what we can do is say, we can sit with the Lord and with people who love us and say, yeah, that was, you know, probably could have made a better choice there. And, but listening to that part of us saying, well, underneath that, what was going on there under like with the core of like, maybe I really wanted to be found beautiful there. Mm -hmm. Maybe I really wanted to, maybe I wanted somebody to pay attention to me. Maybe. And so that, going to the deeper places of what was that part of you in that moment? What was that part of you really looking for? And that removes like the, it helps remove, if we can get to that vulnerability and naming yeah. those desires or naming those hopes, then we can start to really sit in the places of conversion. But to, it really, um, it's one of the ways we'd self-punish. I think it's, it, but it, and many times I've had to go to confession for the ways I've talked to myself, because if mm -hmm. I would talk to anybody else that way, I would have to go to confession. So yeah. many times I've just had to bring like the places of self-hatred to confession and understand what's going on there is that there's a a lot of sorrow, a lot of grief, and a lot of pain that's being expressed there. And 
and we must go to the core of that with mm-hmm. Lord. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it makes total sense because you know ultimately what groomers try to do is make the victim think that they desire their own abuse. Um, yes. to, and and so it's a long played out strategy that I've seen that they do of you know having the, the victim think, okay, th- I do want this. You know, as, as frightening as this is, there's something in this for me. I just spoke to a young person just a couple of weeks ago who's involved in sex trafficking and prostitution, and uh, I was the first person that they had actually told this to, and so we had to get the the police involved and all this other stuff. And it was, you know, really a, an unfortunate situation. But he shared with me that he doesn't even do it for the money anymore. He just does it for the affection. And he, he just wants to feel held, you know, and, and, and it was just so heartbreaking. This kid's like 15, 16 year old kid. And, uh, but, but then who are taking advantage of him in this trafficking ring, you know, wanted to, him to be in a situation where, where you're getting something out of this, you know, this isn't just for us. I mean, yeah, you're getting money, you're getting this affection. Like, and so it, it creates this internal hook. Like I, cho- I'm choosing this. I want this. I'm coming back to this. And it's just this toxic cocktail of of shame and authentic aches, you know, just, just mixing together and you can't distinguish one from the other. And it's almost like you've got this goldfish bowl, pure water, and then you just pour ink into that thing. And before you know it, it just spreads so wide. You can't tell, you know, what's water and what's ink because they've all kind of just blended together and you just kind of resign yourself to like, well, my fault, you know, I did this, the, the abuser, me, we're both complicit in this whole thing. So I need to hate me as much as I hate that person. And then, but when you get in that spot, you know, whether it's abuse or whether, you know, it means not sexual abuse. Maybe you're in a relationship where you're verbally abused for a long time. Maybe you were just in a bad dead end relationship, but you got cheated on and then cheated on again. And then you're living out of this trauma response. How do you even learn to trust again? Because you, you want to be seen, you want to be vulnerable, you want to be safe in someone's embrace. But I've met more teenage girls, especially, than I could count in the last two years or so, that have just said, I'm asexual. That's who I am. Like, I am I am not this, I'm not that, I'm not anything. They just are just like emotionally eunuchs, you know, and, and they just like, there's going to be no receptivity here because it's not a safe place. So how would you... How did you and how would you walk someone through the process of actually learning how to trust again, which is an essential ingredient of love, which is what they want, but then it fears the vulnerability, you know, that they're, they're so scared of. That's the requirement too. So how, how do you learn to trust again when you've been in such a dark hole where you trusted somebody completely and, and they were completely unsafe? So how do you go there again and be safe? Yeah. All those stories that you share, they make sense, don't they? Like mm-hmm. you make sense of like, of course, if that's the only option, then of course I wouldn't want any of that. I would want to, you know, it just, yeah. gosh, it just makes so much sense. And I think, you know, the word trust means to rely or to depend on somebody and people um, for us to depend on them. And, you know, as children, we really don't have a choice because, you know, we have our inner caregivers or in our families of origin, you know, you have to learn how to trust you. You have to learn how to survive in your family of origin. But the beautiful thing about as we grow is that God, by our meaning, made the image and likeness of God, we're given the ability to discern Mm-hmm. And to um, observe people, um, whether they're trustworthy or not. And of course, all of us are going to disappoint each other at times. But I think it, admitting the places, even first and foremost, admitting places where, Lord, my heart has been trusted. My heart has been broken here with trust. I don't know if I can trust you even. <laughs> I don't know if I can trust anybody. But yeah. Lord, I, I think making a simple prayer so we're not in self-reliance in the inner vows of I will never trust anybody again. That's the inner vow. That's a way of me trying yeah. to protect myself. And although it makes sense in light of the story, that just creates a cold, harsified, calcified, um, like barrier around my heart versus the open, the, the vulnerability of our hearts because we're not on a healing journey to get back in control or so nobody can hurt us anymore. We're on a healing journey so we can love like Jesus. Jesus, his heart is vulnerable. So I think what, so it's, it's helpful for us to kind of sit down and look at our patterns. All of us have patterns. So maybe we find ourselves, you know, putting our, our lives in the hands of somebody who, you know, isn't trustworthy, or maybe they're mercurial or they're, and so just kind of noticing like, what are my patterns? Like, what are the people that I keep interacting with? Cause patterns yeah. are never random. And mm-hmm. so what are some things that I notice? And so from that, we can kind of see what our tendencies are. Like we talk about fight, flight, freeze, fawn, flop. Like what are some of my tendencies? Yeah. But then in the people that God sends me in my life, and kind of, and nobody's ever gonna be perfect. But can I look at them and say, is this somebody who does who they what they say they're gonna do? 
mm-hmm. who they say they are. When I offer small parts of my story, which is why we don't ever want to overshare or divulge everything to everybody, because our hearts are sacred gardens, and those are jewels that only very few people have a right to really receive from us. Does the person honor and respect what I have shared with them? Are they encountering me in freedom? Are they somebody that's on their own journey of healing? Are they growing in their relationship with Christ? So there's so many telltale signs of Mm -hmm. we don't, it's sometimes we think it's either all or nothing. Like I have to give myself totally to a person or it's nothing. It's actually neither. So what, what is, what are the people in your life? Are they trustworthy? And and sometimes people in their own brokenness are not. And so asking Lord, Lord, send me, please send me people that are trustworthy. And also understanding that there are people in life who are trustworthy that we're afraid also to trust because of our wounds and, yeah. and experiencing compassion there. But um, noticing our patterns, you know, kind of like, am I, do I keep, you know, overexposing myself to certain people in my life who just don't have the ability to love me because of their own brokenness? And that's something where like, all right, I need to, Lord, what are you inviting me to? But if, if we're not willing to admit like the places where we our heart our heart is hard to t- trust and things like that, and Lord, give me the grace and the willingness to grow here. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you love me where I'm most vulnerable and most dependent. And yeah. and it's from that small seed. Jesus is not overwhelmed by the places we don't trust him. He's mm-hmm. not disgusted by that. He doesn't get mad at us. He doesn't pull away. He understands the places we do not trust him. And what does God do? He shows himself faithful. And the people in our life that love us, that are authentic, they will continue to show themselves faithful. And when they make a mistake, they're going to come back and say, I'm so sorry. I will do better. I apologize. Yeah. That's real love. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a rich reflection that I think we could all spend time on. Like, what are the patterns tell me about myself? Because typically we think the patterns tell me a lot about someone else. Like when I meet high school girls, like how come I keep ending up in these relationships, these dead end guys that won't commit to me? You know, what's the problem with those guys? Why can't I find a good guy? Or why do the empaths or the codependents flock to the narcissistic type of personality? Why is there attraction there? What about the controlling relationship? Why is she gravitating to a guy who wants to control her? You know, or she's gravitating towards these troubled guys, these problem children that she wants to kind of rehabilitate these guys because maybe she had a troubled dad and she couldn't fix him. I mean, I I met a uh, person recently and they said that their sibling is transitioning through surgeries to identify as the other gender because they said then that way when I become the the man I'll be a better dad than I had uh, oh, just, gosh. Whoa, you go to these places oh, and it's yeah. so tempting that they like he's the problem these bad guys are these problems these narcissistic women are probably like, like that's the problem out there but it's like okay if we can actually sit still and say okay yeah there, there's some problems there there's some legit problems there but why is this magnetic effect happening with me why is it other people aren't clinging on to that type of person repeatedly? What is it that I'm discovering in that person's personality or temperament or the challenge of loving them that somehow is validating some insecurity in me or some fear in me? So you can dive in a little bit more into these templates, these patterns of dysfunction that sometimes cause us to live out of our wounds and go towards people that actually don't solve the problems. If anything, they exacerbate them. And so how a person can maybe discern, okay, can I supposed to be even finding healing in this relationship or do I actually need to find healing from this relationship? You know, am I thinking that this is going to be the balm of my wounds when this could be the very thing that's infecting it? Gosh, yeah. You're really doing a great job of talking about attachment theory without talking about attachment theory. <laughs> that's really what you're doing. So that's really that's really true. It's it's one of the greatest, I think, breaking, groundbreaking researches for areas of research that have come out in the last like 50 years of attachment theory of beginning from our mother's womb and then the stories that were sung over us and the relationship of your mom and dad. And even just what fetal science shows now is that when you were in the womb very young, you could already intuit your mother's emotional state. Mm. Um, you knew when she was upset when she wasn't. You knew the relationship between her and her dad. You could intuit your dad's voice. If your mother was ambivalent to you in the womb, it sets up just catastrophic sorrow in the heart of the child. I, it's amazing. So these things don't come out of nowhere. Nothing comes out of nowhere. Nothing in our life is random. And so, you know, very so many podcasts and books on attachment theory that you can read about. But you're really talking about secure attachment, which is our ideal attachment, which we're all growing into. And that's what God gives us a secure attachment that's steadfast, that's healing, that's life giving, that's ongoing, that repairs, that secure attachment. Um, but from areas in our hearts where our parents, if, you know, just in their own brokenness, couldn't receive us, or we all have areas, like every single person on earth has areas of insecure attachment. Some of us have more of an anxious attachment. So when somebody pulls away, our desire is to cling. 
many times those are very codependent and mesh relationships. So you see this in yourself of like when somebody pulls away, if there's an issue, are you the one trying to go and make yourself better or blame yourself or correct it or control other people through that? Some of us in our hearts, just from the pain of needs not being met that needed to be met, some of us become avoidant. So Mm -hmm. our tendency is to pull away or to turn in on ourselves or to shun or to become cold or hard. Some of us just maybe mom and dad are a bit more volatile. So we have more of kind of a um, both and kind of like a, an ambivalent attachment where sometimes it's, it's just kind of in the middle. And so understanding our stories and where we came from is not just a nice exercise or something that's like pop psychology. Like when God says to us, I, before you were in the womb, I knew you, I created you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows our story. And so do you, whether we know it or not, we know our story. And so Hmm. those patterns, we subconsciously many times attract people to ourselves, to our our own degree of healing, people that we think will um, satisfy the places, people that we think we can make sure nobody leaves us. So it's like, you know, the the art of romance or even the art of friends we tracked, it's it's just not random. And so I think... Hmm when we allow the Lord to um, open those places of our hearts and kind of illumine, like, wow, what are some of my patterns? And and like we said, every person has them. Mm-hmm. Lord, wh- and where are you calling me to secure attachment? Like, Lord, where, not not no attachment, but where are you calling me to strong and holy connection? Because it's in strong and holy connection that a human person grows. And that, like we said, comes through repair. It comes through ongoing love. It comes through truth. It comes through peace, for, through virtue. And that's the secure and strong attachment is ultimately what heals us of our addictions. Addictions are a trauma response. And so sometimes, like we said at the very beginning, we're trying to work on the top of the tree. And that's a noble and valiant thing. But until we go all the way down to what we're actually aching for and, and the, the stories that those places hold, until those places are brought into a community relationship, the fruit will continue to manifest. Yeah. And and so, and that's usually the places where we're like, the Athenians tell St. Paul, we'd like to hear on this matter some other time. Like It's like, yeah. no, 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 I'll just put another filter on my phone and, yeah. and go for it. And sometimes we need to do that. But that ultimately, you just ask any human person, like nobody wants to live white knuckling it. Yeah. Nobody wants to live in a calculated measure. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be so free that we could give the gift of ourselves and to receive another fully and not want to grasp or hurt them mm-hmm. or push them away, but just to not try to take, not to be an idol to them, but just that we could love so free that it would bless and give life. I don't know if there's anybody alive who doesn't ultimately want that. No. You no. Know? And that's really what we're, that's what we're talking about. Like that's the kind of transformation we're talking about, not just sin management or behavior mm-hmm. modification. No, that, that that's the end game. But like you said, you got to go down to that. Root yes. system that's scary to look at. I had heard a psychologist recently online and he was talking about, I'd never thought of this before, but he said that infants tend to be remarkably receptive of the moods of their caregivers, that they can perceive mom's in a bad mood, dad's in a bad mood, and they can they can sense that stuff as an infant. And he said, but if you are neglected, abused as a child, he said, what he's found in his own practice is that those types of children typically retain, he said, those almost preternatural abilities to detect uh, yes. the others because it's a, it's a security mechanism, right? Yes. You gotta know if you're safe or not. And if you're yep. not being raised in a safe place, then you better have your guard up. You better have 24 hour surveillance, but it leads to this hyper vigilant, neurotic, just pathological paranoia. And that gets all the attention. Well, that's the problem. It's like, well, no, where's this coming from? Like the, this constant fear of abandonment or rejection or betrayal or infidelity, the, the radar is so high up because you're still living in that infantile affective state of this, uh, of this uh, total, is this a safe spot? Are you safe? And the only way I can know is just by being hyper vigilant of every potential cue that could be on the radar. Even if I'm misreading half of these things, uh, you're either going to be black or white. I'm going to spoil you into one or two categories, because if you're not all safe, I just have to trust that you're probably a dangerous person. And so I'm going to just label you that, keep you at a distance, because otherwise I'm not safe. And not realizing like, wow, where's all this coming from? It's because that one, that two-year-old, that that stuff, you you haven't let, you know, that stuff surface in a safe environment of counseling. So I don't know if that resonates with experiences you've had personally or with others in counseling. Oh my gosh, both and. Yes. And that makes so much sense. It's makes so much sense. And like we said, many times we spend our lives hating those places or like, oh, I'll get over it. But it's literally the body does keep the score. It's written in there. And then until we can allow that part of it, that's why part of what we talked about earlier of like, when, say you find yourself being hypervigilant 
And instead of automatically trying to placate somebody or make sure somebody's not in a bad mood or just to be like, to check in with yourself and say, what's going on right here? Mm -hmm. Like, what's happening? Like, what do I, and that will tell us that will many times allow those places of our hearts to speak. And those are, those are very important things because like, that's, that's how, that's how we grow that those are the uncomfortable things that are played out in our day-to-day life. Like we said so beautifully that we often just blame everybody else, uh, everybody else for, but what's happening within our arts, like how am I experiencing that? And that's, that's going to tell us the places where we need to go. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's funny because like the the body can't lie. I mean, I, I was at a, I did CrossFit recently and I messed up my shoulder mm-hmm. rotator cuff doing, you know, way more than I should have been doing. Uh, cause I, I'd let my ego come into the gym that day instead of leaving it out in the parking lot where it belongs and, uh, kind of tore, you know, a rotator cuff, just a minor thing. Oh, and, no. You know, it, it's fine. It's, it's a lot better now. And, and, you know, did some physical therapy and they did some, you know, cupping where you look like you got the octopus thing. Yes. Going on. And, mm-hmm. You know, my kids saw it like that. I'm like, well, I had to defend the family from a giant squid, but you're all safe. And, <laughs> You know, that's why I look like this. But it was interesting when they, you know, they, they'd put it on the pain point, you know, the spot, those were like noticeably darker, like the, like the blood needed to go to those areas. But it was interesting. I'm like, yeah, like, could, could you just throw some up on my traps? Because I just had a lot of uh, just tension and stress. And they, they kind of put some up on my traps and like, holy cow. I mean, the thing was like, I mean, you probably see it just, just, it was like dark red and it was really fascinating of just like oh. their body knows what the heck is going on. And so yeah. this might be a new strategy for people in the whole healing process. Like you doubt your imagination, especially if you're being gaslighted and things like that. And you're in relationships where you're really for years have been taught to doubt your own intuition and feelings. Like just trust your body. Like when you're around that person, is it just like, like, is, is it tension, you know, just in your spirituality, just learn to trust that. And, and some of that might be because that person's objectively not safe. Sometimes it could be like, no, they actually are safe, but you're projecting onto that person, the trauma that somebody else did to you. And so you can't necessarily write that person off. You've got to think, okay, well, maybe they're safe, but maybe I'm just projecting some wounds from someone else who was not safe, but the tension's here. And so it's telling me something. And so let's go there. And so if someone wants to go there, if someone wants to learn more about the body, like more about the the healing, if they just know, okay, Sister Miriam, you just opened a can of worms for 45 minutes in my life. And now all this stuff is, I feel like is emotionally vomiting up in me. Like, where do they go? Like, okay, where can someone go to connect with retreats, with you, with your podcast, with ministry that you're doing, with local counselors? Where would you recommend someone go if we feel like, okay, we just stirred this pot up and now we're just going to put a nice little bumper on the podcast and move on to the next episode. Where do they go to, to bring all these things when they feel like, okay, who do I turn to? I know this is stirred up, but I don't know how to process it. Sure. Yeah. And that's something we really want to guard against is like stirring it up and saying, well, you know, keep warm and well fed. Good luck with that. Cause that's yeah. not, that's not our heart and that's not the way that God um, loves us. And so I think one of the best resources that I found is that it's a free resource. It's a podcast but by Dr. Bob Schutz called restore the glory. Mm-hmm. And he has one of some of the best guests and just a lot of great topics on everything that we've talked about today in a much slower and much more detailed manner. And they have so many different kinds of series. Like they have a series on wounds. They have a series on mother wounds, father wounds, um, adoption. Uh, they have uh, healing, all kinds of stuff. And I think that people, your listeners could go to the podcast today. And then Dr. Bob's book, Be Healed. I would highly recommend um, the book, Be Healed. The, bu- the book that you mentioned earlier, The Body Keeps the Scores, it's written about 10 years ago, but it's a very good starting point. Um, the mm-hmm. author is not Catholic. Okay. So I'm not endorsing everything he talks about, but it's very interesting. I've kind of noticing, I, I really do believe the body shouts, but our hearts are afraid to whisper. Mm-hmm. And so our bodies are often telling us things. Um, that we have uh, healing and healing retreats called the Healing the Whole Person through the John Paul II Healing Center. I would highly recommend that. Uh, I'm sure I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, with Jay Stringer who wrote the book Unwanted, yep. which is about. I, I would recommend that because that really also does talk about getting to the deeper places of where our sexuality or we're living sexuality out of brokenness rather than in wholeness. So those are really good resources as well. And some of what Dan Allender uh, writes as well. Bob's Bob's book Be Restored is also about sexual brokenness and it goes down to these deep places also. So and there's so much great work about attachment theory and things like that out there that, I mean, just some great articles of kind of helping you not figure yourself out or scratch at yourself, but really allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and to illumine where he wants to bring you into wholeness and communion because ultimately healing is not fixing. Healing is an ongoing encounter with God's love that brings us into wholeness and communion. 
And that's an ongoing encounter. So that's why you and I even are are continually on a healing journey because there's every single one of us needs an ongoing encounter with all these different places of our hearts that bring us into wholeness and communion. And that's, is the school of love. And we're all in that school. No, that's a beautiful way to look at it because I think a lot of people have been through a lot of traumas. Like I can't fix that. I can't change that. What's the point of going back and reliving those memories and bringing all that stuff? It can't be fixed because that's their notion of healing. It's just like an eraser and it's just going to take it away. And they know that nothing can just take it away. And they don't seem like the end game is for you to be free to love. You know, the end game is for you to freely receive love, receive love, to see another, to be seen. And if that becomes the end game, it's like, okay, I can go for that. I'd like to have that because I don't know how we're going to erase this mess in the rear view mirror, but- if there's something more beautiful ahead on the road, then instead of having to back up three miles and fix that dumpster fire or whatever, maybe we can acknowledge it, but go to someplace beautiful. Um, that's awesome. And so I'll put on, in the show notes those links that you had mentioned. But then I also want to point people to the ministry that you're doing right now with Friends of the Bridegroom. Because could, could you just kind of share what that ministry looks like? Sure. Yeah. Friends of the Bridegroom is in partnership with its founder, Father John Burns, um, in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. And it is the healing, renewal, and expansion of religious life. And it's the counterpart to the healing of the bride, because when the bride is well, the church is well, when mom is well, right, the family is well. And so through that is the healing of the priesthood. And so our mission is dedicated toward the healing and renewal of women religious and through that the priesthood and i think that's really the deepest part of my own heart because Mm -hmm. i really think if if like we said if mom and dad of the family if they're not well the church is not going to be well so how -hmm. can we come to love our religious sisters and love our priests into wholeness and communion everything we've talked about today so that they can give the gift the gift of themselves and be really like the eschatological sign that we're called to be. And so you wow. can check out the website. It's called renewreligious.org. There's a great intro video by Father John and a lot of different videos about how to discern religious life. But ultimately, we're talking about the heart of the human person and the gift of belonging exclusively to Christ, which is a, a sign of heaven. And that's why we find religious sisters so beautiful, right? Is because we're a sign of heaven. So. No, you are. I mean, it's uh, you, you never see smiles like you do walking into some like cloistered convent. I mean, the joy of like <laughs> yeah. walking into a waterfall. But I love the work that you're doing there because I think a lot of people in the pews just think, okay, father's got a collar on, sister's got her habit on. They're all good. Like they got it all together. We've got their lives all sorted out. They're, they're just like perfect saints on earth kind of thing. Um, but I, I remember one memory I had, I was speaking in a particular area of the country. I won't disclose where it was because the I don't want to expose the identity of the individual, but um, there was a religious sister that lived in that area who had a tremendous devotion to our ministry. And she would offer up her suffering for us. She would intercede in a powerful way. And she was in a cloistered convent. And so she and I would communicate via mail, just asking her various petitions and things like that. And she'd correspond every once in a while. And then I knew I was going to be in that area of the country to speak. And so I went, I did a bunch of high schools. And then I came to visit her at her cloistered convent. And she came out into the parlor and, and I got to see her for the first time, you know, face to face. I think she'd heard my, I think my presentation way back in high school or something. I don't remember. But, you know, now she's a, you know, fully consecrated religious sister, cloistered, everything. And I said, oh, well, could you please play for these specific intentions of these kids I met today? And, you know, this kid is struggling with this. And I said, oh, please pray for her. You know, she's struggling with self-harm. She's cutting herself. And the sister said, oh, I'll, I'll pray in a special way for her because I understand. And she rolled up her, the sleeves of her habit and showed me the history of the lacerations on her arms when, when she was a teenager before she experienced her conversion of how she would turn to self-harm to medicate the, this, the, the trauma that she was going through in her own life. And they were all healed over. I mean, they, they weren't, you know, the, the way they were that I've seen when they're kind of fresh. But they've been healed and, and she's gone to counseling, still goes to counseling. But it's she was so real, so authentic of just being like, I get it. And just because I have this beautiful habit on and this glorious smile and this wonderful prayer life doesn't mean that I haven't been through the tri- you know, <laughs> through the ringer myself. And so just to know that there are members of the religious communities that not only have been through these harrowing experiences um, but and, and have healed, but many who have brought them into the cloister or into the priesthood or into the seminary, and it's only 5% dealt with. And, you know, they're plowing forward in their vocations and God bless them because that could 
probably legitimately the vocation he is calling them to. But it's like, okay, now that I'm in, how do I disclose to my other sisters that, you know, this is still a struggle that I have, that, yeah, I'm, I'm a priest now, and I know I should have gotten rid of this before the seminary, but this is still something that I'm struggling with. So the very fact that you're going out there and just giving people, I think, the freedom to kind of find healing within their vocations instead of thinking, okay, if you didn't figure it all out beforehand, then you just kind of kind of fake it till you make it kind of thing. God bless you for doing that for them. Oh, thank you, friend. It's a, it's a great it's a great gift and it's a great honor and it's true. You know, non, priests and sisters are just people with stories, just like everybody else. And and I think the most profound reality of all of this is that it's in our sorrowful. There's a saying that the gift and the wound lay side by side. The gift mm-hmm. and the wound, and it's in the very places. I'm sure you can look in your own life. It's in the very places where our hearts have been broken and and where we experience deep sorrow, it's mysteriously through the grace of God that's in those very, not around them or not in spite of them, but through them, that you and I learn how to love with a power in a way that we would have never known any other way. Yeah. I, like how else do we know how to love other than the places where our own hearts have been broken and by the sovereign plan of God and just in his mystery of why he allows the happy faults? Yeah. And that's not just a pious thing, but that's true. I think of, you know, all the places where you'd be like, oh, I wish this wouldn't have happened to me, Lord. Like I wish, like Frodo, I wish the ring had never come to me, right? I wish yeah. none of this had happened. But it's like in that sacred journey of being a ring bearer that it's transformed into glory. And, yeah. and I think that's something we have to hold on to is that your wounds are not random. Your life is not random. God's love for you is not random. It's solid and true. And, and he loves you. And it's in the very places that you probably hate most about yourself yeah. that God's going to come and bring his kindness there and a beauty that you, beauty that you've never known will come if you allow that to happen. And that's a sacred, <laughs> that's yeah. a sacred and beautiful thing. Yeah. That is. So the, basically in his tenderness and in his providence, your wounds become his entry door. Amen. And we just, we want to lock it up. We want to be like, go anywhere but there. Yes. You know, come in the door, come in the window, come in the chimney, but not that place. You know, so your, your vulnerability, your witness, I think is just going to help so many people be like, okay, God, you know, I'll take off my seven padlocks off of this wound and I'm going to let you come in it because maybe I'm irredeemable if I don't let you enter into my heart through this wound. You know, and so the very place I thought that I lost you is the only place that I'm really going to ultimately find you for the first time. So God bless you. And we love you. <laughs> You're so awesome, sister. And thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your yes. And uh, could you maybe close us in a prayer for all of the viewers and the listeners for all our own healing, um, for all our own vocations and for any work that God thinks he knows he needs to do it's still in us. Sure. Yeah, let's do that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you, and we just thank you for your kindness. Lord, I ask that you would just cover us in your precious blood in all the places that have been brought forth today. I pray your loving kindness, that your truth would meet us here in all these places. I just pray that you would fill us, Lord, that you would bless and seal this time, and I pray that you would continue to unfold our hearts at your own pace, Lord, and in your own way. I pray that you would send us people on the journey to be with us, to walk with us, to to help heal and guide. I pray, Lord, that you would give us the fortitude and the resilience to continue to say yes to you. Give us the grace and the courage to forgive those who have hurt us, to forgive ourselves, to come into authentic truth and healing. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill us with courage, fill us with light, fill us with peace, fill us with rest, comfort. Open our hearts, soften our hearts in places where they've been hard or cold. Come, Holy Spirit. And Mother Mary, we ask for your tender intercession, especially in any areas where mothers or feminine hearts have hurt us. Mother, I ask that you would just pray for each one of us, especially deeply there, that you would let us rest upon your heart, that your beauty would heal, would bring into wholeness and communion. And we ask the intercession of all of our guardian angels and all of our patron saints, and we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Your Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. And in exchange for your gift to you, uh, to us for being on this show, I just want to ask everybody who's watching or listening to this before you click off and finish the episode or, or right after you do, uh, just say Hail Mary for Sister Miriam, for the fruitfulness of her work, for all those that she's ministering to, for everybody in the SOLT religious community, for all those discerning religious life that they might explore uh, the beauty of your order as well. So if you could just wrap all up in one little Hail Mary and send it in the direction of Sister Miriam, that can be our thank you gift uh, for having you on the show today. So God bless you, uh, Sister Miriam. We love you. Thank you so much, friend. God bless you too.